Okay, as I say, tonight's kind of short uh, kind of broadcast or transmission, so I'm just going to move the pointer, <coughs> is uh, it's part of a series connected with the uh, ritual year, or what I might call a Setian ritual year. So it, it's my idea. It, it's a ritual year that I kind of can, I don't know what you'd say, created or discovered or or whatever, a bit of both, I suppose, uh, that I've followed for a number of cycles now, and uh, mostly, you know, as part of the magical work, and I've developed a certain amount of literature and, uh, that's published in the book, uh, The Ritual Year in Ancient Egypt, um, with some, you know, obviously, it's, it's like... Um, any, any sort of set of literature as you use it, you kind of add to it or you take things out and whatever, but it still pretty much works. Uh, and I thought it would be, or it was suggested to me by Miriam Davy, that, that uh, it would be a good idea to um, to kind of share some of this as in real time, uh, as, as much as that possible, or to warn people, so that we could kind of share it and... Um, so you knew that there was a kind of ritual coming up or that people were doing a particular ritual based on a particular piece of my mythology and and, and uh, as we get to know each other and work together and, and stuff all over the world that, that we might be spread out that this would have um, this would create a kind of I don't know whether they call it an egregore or whatever it would just add to it and, and maybe <laughs> I got a message to say, you you sound good, you can get on with it now. <laughs> Guess who that is. Okay, so um, so in, in this ritual year, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, as it happens, so the, because I'm using this kind of uh, lunar s s uh, sequence, uh, which is a little bit different to what um, is normally kind of used by people who reconstruct the uh, Egyptian religion as, as a as ritual year, but I'll, maybe I'll go into a little bit of that in a minute. Uh, it starts on the new moon, which is a few days ago now, and uh, you, you get the entire lunar month uh, and with its ebb and flow in, in which to work with a particular god or goddess that uh, is that, and usually by coincidence or may, maybe I kind of to tweak it that way, that there's always a kind of Setian connection, really. Um, so, and and also, it always seems to fit with the cycle of the year you find in other systems. So, uh, it's June, and obviously we're getting close to the summer solstice, uh, when a lot of people, magicians and pagans and whatever, all over the place, uh, kind of uh, doing ritual. It's a special time for them, really, and it just happens. You have to kind of make this the 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 the, the month that's that's known in the Egyptian calendar as Mesore, uh, which literally means the birth of of Ra or Re, uh, birth of the sun. It 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 starts now, right? It it just happens to start a few days ago on a new moon, and it, so it takes up the whole of June. So that means that the the months in which the sun god is born uh, coincides with the months in which we have a very popular solar festival in all parts of the world, but certainly in Britain, uh, focused often at Stonehenge, which is for the summer solstice. So these things are probably deliberate. Well, there's a reason, you know, I'll go into that in a minute. I wanted to kind of, before I go into it too much, I'm not going to speak for very long, just try not to anyway, 20 minutes. Uh, just to mention that uh, the, a, a sort of obituary, if you like, or dedicate this talk to the scholar uh, Herman Tevelder, who um, wrote a rather amazing book, influential book, um, on uh, the god Set, called Set, God of Confusion, and he passed away a few, I think it's just a few days ago. Um, and Another one of the companions, uh, Leila, showed me, she sent me rather 
usefully uh, his bibliography because I said I think he'd written he's very famous um, Egyptologist really and he's written lots of stuff on, not just on set but on demonology and all sorts of things and he sent me this list and there was I, I think there must have been about at least a hundred pop publications really really interesting things um, but, but of course that book set God of Confusion is had this kind of life outside of the academic world really it had a huge impact on um, on the neo-pagan community and sort of increased people's inf knowledge of the the cult of set uh, so in a way he was an inspiration for the the setians one way or another and the kind of reading in fact when you read some of the early accounts as i talked about this in my book uh, set two ways so when you read about the people's accounts of how they started organizations like the Temple of Set, it was a it was that book really. It was someone bringing that that along and saying, "Lee, look at this really interesting book." Uh, that kind of inspired people, uh, gave them a certain depth really, and uh, uh, that that wasn't there in the material before. So uh, respect to Herman Tavalda. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to make him into one of the Gnostic saints, but you never know, right? He had a huge influence um, on us, so that's just we remember him. So going back then to the month, I might just change my glasses. <laughs> so the month means uh, Masore which I've written, I think, as the, the title of the talk, Mess. And the word mess, really, to, which means birth, uh, it's probably, it's sort of cognate with the name Moses as well, because that's what the name, they say the name Moses is uh, means born, right? Or, in a sense, he's kind of come born from the waters kind of thing. Uh, so Mesa or Musa, it's, it's kind of there in the Egyptian, very ancient Egyptian word, really, birth of Ra. So... I suppose you think, is this the new year? Is it the beginning of a new year or is it the end of an old one? And that's a kind of strange thing about this uh, month is that actually Mesore occurs right at the end of the year. It's the last sacred month of the year. So I suppose it's kind of liminal in some ways. This calendar, the lunar calendar, which is... Um, it's older, it's, I described this in the book, it's much older than the more famous calendar, the 360 plus 5 days that we know of from Egyptian culture, which itself is a very, very old calendar, of course. It coincides with the rise of the cult of Osiris. It's, it's really, it's as old as the pyramids, but, you know, there are records from before that time, all the things that survive, of a lunar ritual year, and... In a way, this is, and in, in that book, they, they, you have sort of uh, 30 days of, sorry, I have 12 months of 30, 30 days each, really. And um, whenever you have a, a lunar calendar, you, you always have to have some way of calibrating it uh, to set in a, a, you need a fixed point from, from the heavens each year in order to, Fix, fix it uh, to decide where, because uh, as is well known, you in a lunar calendar you have um, mostly twelve uh, months of thirty days, but every three or four years you need an extra month, right, to kind of bring everything back to normal again. Otherwise, it wanders all over the place. Uh, so to keep it in sync with the seasons and everything, you need this, and, and to to work out when to do that, you need a fixed point usually taken from the stars. So the lunar calendar, the, the lunar calendar is either called lunar uh, sothic, if you like, which is, it's, it's somehow uh, calibrated with the helical rising of, of the Sirius or the, or the dog star uh, Sothis, or lunar solar when it's taken from the, win actually from the winter solstice. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying that Ra, there are two, there, there are several other versions of the same thing. That's why Egyptian stuff is quite difficult, complex and contradictory sometimes. The birth of Ra could either take place at the winter solstice or it can take place 
at the summer solstice really now we actually say i said and that's the lunar sothic one now you say well solstice is not what's sothic got to do with it if you know anything about the sothic cycle in sirius you'd say that the helical rising of sirius takes place in about july late july in fact nothing to do with the solstice but it's fairly obvious really that the helical rising of sirius once upon a time thousands of years ago actually coincided more was much closer to the summer solstice and the two festivals were kind of linked with each other probably hence you get the, the this lunar cycle where the birth of ra takes place in this month round about the summer solstice and the new year begins at the end of this month unless there has to be an extra month then we have to wait a month for the new year and the new year will be we'll talk about it when it comes sacred either to the god thoth uh, or if you're a sectarian if you like you can make it your particular deity but gets to be first and um, so hence i put set there because i like that okay um so the you can do this sort of work with Ra the entire month, as you can with all the other things, uh, the other gods that we've discussed. But obviously, as it is the most appropriate day to work with the birth of Ra, the way it occurs every day, is, uh, is to do this at the summer solstice itself. And so the liturgy and the ritual is, is really, uh, that, that's when probably, if you're going to kind of, uh, coordinate and think about each other doing this probably that's when I'm really going to be doing something uh, will be for the summer solstice that's the actual ritual and I'll kind of mention that a little bit later uh, <clears throat> when we get in the month when we get closer to it but the idea is to can prepare now and you can sort of start the process off and start thinking about the liturgy but you know you can do it at any point in this process and as we'll see let's say to illustrate this as the thing I put the, the rather lovely uh, color drawing of the worshiping of the sun uh, is is a painting taken uh, from the tomb of Ramesses III in the Valley of the Kings uh, obviously they you know improved it there they've repainted it but uh, it's rather nice um, and you know you can learn a lot just from looking at that picture really uh, as you can with all these pictures i think a lot of egyptian stuff doesn't require you to read stuff as much as to look at pictures so and the other thing that was that we that was posted that is useful i think and that <laughs> is ma a piece of magic really or or that that you can find magic in it if you know if, if you if you do the work uh that was posted by miriam davy and has kind of uh been benefiting from instruction on this and been pointed towards it it was the great hymn to the aten uh which is a, another one of these amazing uh magical texts that's uh or uh ritual texts liturgy texts that survives from the from ancient Egypt and the full text of it is being is there uh, there is a, a magical ritual in there uh, it's quite long and if you have to it, it pays reading through it, it with care maybe on the on an appropriate day use it as a meditation and uh, go through it line by line and apparently I'm told well I know this is going to be the case that uh, there's some rather special things to find in there <clears throat> so i'm not going to go into too much more detail about that particular one the the ritual in a way right that that uh, great hint of the atom was is the earliest piece of lit liturgy right it's before the stuff that i'm going to discuss now the stuff i'm discussing now is sort of comes afterwards and maybe even derived from it so in the book um I give quite a lot of this, so I'm just going to do a little bit of it. I should say that the, the vast majority of Egyptian 
magical hymns uh, and are devoted to two gods, Osiris and the sun god Ra. So the, in a way you could define the entire Egyptian religion from just those two cults because most almost everything is about them one way or another um, and you would uh, you, you could say that the, the cult of Ra uh, of the sun god is well, I guess it's right it's going to be the, probably the oldest one of the oldest religions of, of humanity isn't it the worst sun worship is one of our oldest things uh, I, I posted again the little kind of pre-dynastic uh, ritual plate for I don't know what they put on that but uh, it's very interesting which even has this kind of little picture there's no words then little picture of almost like a, a meditation on the sun at dusk to, through the hours of the night to dawn so and that's old and there's even older stuff so it's the solar religion is really really old and in a way, there's lots of aspects of the Osirian cult that kind of just take over the Ra stuff anyway. He's kind of uh, to the two cults. That's the, that. That's what you have to do really is maintain the secrets of Osiris and worship the sun. That's probably ninety percent of Egyptian religion. So, rituals to the sun, characteristically, in this tend to be very long, very very long. Uh, there's a lot to say. There's, so there's a lot of them. There's a lots and lots of these solar hymns in existence, and they they're very long hymns as well. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's a particular mindset. It's like a meditation reading through the thing because it's so long, gets you into a kind of rhythm, uh, and they have a rhythm. The great the 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 litany of the sun. Which comes after the the the, the, the uh, great hymn to the Atom. Uh, this comes from like almost everything in Egypt. It comes from the tomb of Seti the First in the Valley of the Kings. There's an awful lot of stuff on the walls. It's like a library. There's so many magical texts written on the walls that you know. There's just huge amount of stuff. Uh, that wasn't really well. You don't even get that material if you go when you go into the tomb. It's not so well known. It's quite secretive in a way. So the tomb of Seti the First, which is a wonderful masterpiece of the ancient world, so-called Belzoni's tomb. I, I'm going to date it about 1350 uh, before the Common Era, so a long time ago. Uh, so these texts. All the solar hymns, they kind of give you a different... It's sometimes said this is a more the priestly religion, but maybe it's just a, a more kind of meditator's kind of view, a deeper point of view. There's a common point of view, which is set in Egypt, which is the polytheism. There are lots of different gods and spirits and all the rest. And then there's a kind of a more philosophical... Uh, magical point of view I suppose in the sense that magic reconstructs these things by thinking and doing them going goes into them in much detail and reconstructs them which is more pantheistic that a god like Ra is imminent in nature in all sorts of things in in, in uh, the elements in the physical sun itself in the river in the animals the whole thing it's God is all these different emanations, really, and and thus was with the connection with Set. You see, there's oh, there's a very strong relationship between Set and the Sun God Ra. Uh, Set is the emanation of the Sun God Ra, as are all the gods. Um, but he's a particular emanation. He emanates particular powers that he needs at particular times, so and when he needs passion and aggression and uh, defense he that's that's why he emanated this god set to, to take this function to protect him uh, from the forces of chaos and non-being that threaten the the path that threaten our rebirth 
uh, every day and when we go to sleep, uh, you know, it's a mystery. Why do we wake up again? You know, why does the human computer suddenly come back online? Having been in this kind of unconscious state, suddenly it comes back to life. As this, uh, it could so easily not be the case, you know, but there's a, there's something there in the, that kind of uh, brings us through, that wakes us up in a way. And that's the same for that set and the sun. That's, and they have a particular moment when they're together as well, which is, they're not together, also, but certainly just before dawn on the solstice, set and well, the sun god are definitely in each other's company because that's, that's when they have a lot of stuff to, to do. Um, so we're talking about a pantheistic stuff. I'll just give you a little taste of that. Uh, this is the Litany of Ra, uh, which is a huge document. God, it must be going over walls and walls within this huge too. And it is done. I mean, it's interesting that, to me anyway. It says, uh, this is the book, uh, the, the title of the book is The Beginning of the Book of the Worship of Ra in the West, which is the heavenly region and of the worship of the United One in the West. <laughs> and when anyone reads this book, which is another interesting thing, is it specifically says that when, whenever someone reads this book, so the reading of the book itself is the enactment of the ritual to some extent. The, the mere reading of, of a text is, that's magic. That, that is a magical, because the expression of words and the holding of a book, that so often in the Egyptian culture, they say that, that uh, whenever I read this book, you know, the, the book is very, obviously a very special thing. Um, and together with the book, they have porcelain figures which are placed upon the ground. I don't know what those figures were, right? But you, you have little clay figures, in other words that are placed on the on the ground uh, at the hour of the setting of the sun, right? So the, the part of this is done, so when the sun goes into the west, into the underworld, uh, and when, when he needs to triumph over the, his enemies, right, as he goes there, because, you know, this is an ordeal. It's an ordeal of the night. And so that's homage to the Ra, supreme power, the master of the hidden spheres, that cause all principles to arise, who dwell in the universe, and who is born as the all surrounding universe. See, it's everything really. Homage to the Ra supreme power, power, the beetle, i.e., Kephra, that folds that rest in the Imperium, and that is born as his own son. So he gives birth to himself, uh, as we do in a way from moment to moment when we are born, uh, when we wake up after the night, we give birth to ourselves. Uh, and Ra, of course, creates everything from himself. <clears throat> How much to the Ra supreme power, Tanen, the ancient earth god who produces the other gods and who fashions what is in him and who is born with whatever is born within his sphere. Anyway, that's just three lines. Each line is a little like a like a sutra text of later times. It's it's got a whole kind of very complicated, very interesting insight into the nature of life, the nature of the cosmos. It's all there. And I should say that the text itself is very very long. It got that's ten verses there, but it goes on for pages and pages in the, in the published version, I can't think, maybe probably about 40 or 50 chapters. So it's quite a meditation on life and on death and on the world. And uh, some of that will play a role <coughs> in the solstice ritual. The other thing I wanted to mention before um, minding up really, God, <laughs> use all the time, it is um, the the spell. So from later times, so you you've got the great hymn to the Aten, uh, and then you've got this litany of Ra comes afterwards, and then later times, you've also got these very long grimoires to do with Ra, 
of and the sun. And now they're using it to to give life to other things, which is some of the mysteries in this, to give life to objects, to give life to another person, to bless them, to give life to a, an object like a ring, a ring of power or um, an amulet, to give life to a statue or a, a mummy, which is like a statue as well, to give life to a temple, to give life, whenever you need to give life to something, this this, this ritual develops and this is what you do. So you know, it's probably going to be the sort of thing. As magicians, you might kind of, you bless each other, you give life, you breathe life into each other. Um, and of course, famously, this ritual is related to the, uh, a ritual called the opening of the mouth. Um, where you you make a kind of object or you make a mummy or you take the corpse which is dead and you do things to it and then you breathe life into it the power of using the power of ra really is that these all these rituals are all connected to each other uh, they're all variations on the same theme so this is a very uh, fruitful uh, area of magic and so this, again, this is given in the book, the Ritual Euro in Ancient Egypt, and it's from the uh, Greek Magical Papyrus, so you can find a version in there as well. Uh, and again, it starts with a very, very long hymn to the Triple Sun, and Triple Sun being the sun at dawn, uh, in his when he's born, uh, at midday when he's in his maximum strength, and in the evening when he's old and declining into the west and needs assistance to not be bitten by the snakes and, and to succumb. So he comes back. And the same thought is there, right, if you think about it, of the pantheism, the pantheistic thought in the triple, in the address to the triple sun <coughs> is there. And the same ritual pattern is there, that you start by pray into the sun then you become the sun and then there's a kind of something there's a magical result uh, that comes from that the pattern is all is ancient it goes through all these things detectable in all these different things and certainly in the later magic and um, this is which we, we we like so much so just briefly then because I, I can't possibly read all this but just to give you an example, so I invoke and beseech the consecration. So it's a consecration. <clears throat> and then addressing the sun, O gods of the heavens, O gods under the earth, O gods circling in the mid region, are from one womb. O masters of all the living and the dead, of he O heedful in many necessities of gods and men. O concealer of things now seen, O directors of Isis, Nemesis, and Andras, dear, who spend every hour with you, O sender of fate who travels around the whole world, O commander of the rulers, O exalted of the abased, O revealer of the hidden, O guide of the winds, O arouser of the waves, O bringer of fire at the appropriate time, O creators and benefactors of every race, O lords and controllers of kings, come. Come, benevolent ones, for the purpose for which I call you, and as benevolent assistance in this right for my benefit. <clears throat> 